Hello, uh, my name is Ari Kashishin, and I will be talking about obesity, medical and surgical treatment options, and their relative outcomes. Uh, first, I'd like to thank the uh, Armenian American Medical Society's uh, CME and the Board of Directors for asking me to present. Um, I've been asked to uh, Um, there is no financial uh, disclosures uh, to be made and um, uh, I would like to essentially start the presentation by going over some basic um, understanding of what we know about obesity, the diagnostic criteria, um, and then discuss about the historical perspective and how we are, uh, uh, we've arrived today to the surgical and medical options that are available. Um, it is important to appreciate that obesity um, cannot be just simplified into a disease of overeating, a lack of exercise. There is a significant amount of information that has come up in the last uh, 10 to 20 years that points out to the multifactorial and multimodality aspect of the obesity. Um, Interestingly enough, one, we will talk later on about the um, uh, GLP-1 type of medications, Vigovia and Ozempic, and that's a neg the, an example of how um, uh, numerous multiple pathways uh, that control metabolic and energy balances play a role into uh, obesity, and um, uh, which explains and uh, supports the idea of why patients can't just lose the weight by you know, decreasing their energy intake and uh, joining a gym, for example. Um, the Looking at these multiple variables, it is important to appreciate that um, not all patients will have every uh, aspect of them. And uh, there are patients that primarily have hormonal di disturbances, uh, practices that primarily, for example, deal with infertility, uh, very frequently we'll have patients that have uh, some element of thyroid dysfunction um, and even though uh, anatomically and physiologically they may have all of the uh, proper level and functioning of the sex organs and anatomy, they still can't conceive. So that may be an example of how minimal hormonal disturbances can, uh, can have significant uh, uh, long-term consequences uh, physiologically. Uh, when it comes to psychological um, uh, components, uh, for the longest time, there had been an incorrect connection between obesity and uh, depression, where patients were told the, uh, or led to believe that the connection between depression and obesity was a cycle where a patient would get depressed, and that would lend them to uh, make poor choices, and as they would gain weight, they'd become more depressed. It wasn't until the uh, recognition that the SSRI medications versus um, uh, tricyclic antidepressants, even though they were treating the, uh, the diagnosis of the depression, were functioning differently. So um, the recognition was that the connection between depression and obesity is not necessarily a cause and effect type of a thing, but both of them have to do with the serotonin uh, uh, uptake, generation, and metabolic derangement, um, which is why you see different weight loss profile in the treatment of depressed patients when they're treated with SSRI versus uh, tricyclic antidepressant. Um, extension of this may be a patient's exercise tolerance. Uh, we, uh, may I mentioned the thyroid dysfunction earlier. Uh, it is not also uncommon where we may see patients in our office that have all of the diagnostic criteria of a hypothyroidism, uh, um, the depression, uh, infertility, hair loss, uh, well, the, uh, heat or cold intolerances, um, uh, fatigue, uh, and yet when, you, uh, when their TSH levels are checked as a part of a thyroid panel, the patients may be dismissed as uh, not a thyroid 
uh, related problem. It is uh, quite frequently we see those patients where we start them with a low, low dose thyroid medication in lieu of having a theoretically a, a, a normal thyroid function labs and with a very low level thyroid uh, uh, medication they improve. A subset of patients, uh, this group patients also may have some level of adrenal insufficiency where low dose uh, steroids transiently also help them to improve the response of the thyroid that they either um, have intrinsically or they get uh, in a form of a prescription um, and they significantly improve uh, symptoms and their weight. Um, when it comes to obesity, uh, in a general terms, uh, in the last 30 years or so, this uh, uh, graph um, uh, from 2023 shows the increasing incidence of obesity in both male, female, and general population. There has been parallel both between both sexes, um, and we continue to see this um, not only in um, uh, developed countries but also in developing countries too. Uh, from a, a global perspective, there are dire consequences of the continuous uh, rate of obesity, um, not only from comorbidities, uh, but also from health expenditure, cost of the treatment of the patients, um, both again from an obesity perspective and from the comorbidities perspective. Um, want to shift gear and then think about uh, the treatment options that are available. Uh, when we're looking at the treatment options, we look at these into two different um, uh, forms of treatment and this is after the patient has already made a decision by themselves having tried multi-drug dietary plans and exercise plans be uh, just going on um, uh, diets that may they may get from social media or getting Weight Watchers and the like um, and uh, going to the gym with a phys uh, uh, with a trainer um, the ideal treatment when we're looking at this before we start thinking about what should or should not be recommended to our patients, we need to look at the, um, the big picture of each one of the treatments available. The medical or the surgical treatments need to be effective. This means that we need to really read the fine print. Um, uh, we will highlight some of those fine prints that not, are not at all uh, uh, transparent to the clinicians or the patients and uh, we have patients in our office that are uh, requesting uh, treatment A or B based on what they saw uh, uh, on a TikTok uh, or a Instagram posting or they uh, saw a news clip uh, at 8 o'clock on a local channel for example. So the effectiveness of a treatment needs to be um, understood. The weight loss needs to be durable. There may be a lot of treatments that may have a relatively good short-term result over a matter of days, weeks, or months, but then over time they resolve. Um, uh, and uh, the weight loss um, goes away, patients gain their weight back, um, and then comorbidities return. Um, a uh, next item would be the the uh, treatment needs to be reproducible. Uh, quite frequently, uh, we may see um, publications or data that um, very specific to a subset of patients. A group of uh, medications uh, may work well for, or a treatment plan may work well for a patient of a certain age, uh, ethnicity, and it may not be um, applicable to the population at, uh, at large. Um, as far as treatments, the next item would be uh, ideally we want to have a, the lowest side effect and risk with the uh, most benefit. Uh, we all in clinical world uh, appreciate that everything that we do, whether it's writing a prescription, uh, recommend a uh, uh, certain um, uh, treatment plan or offer the patient surgery, each one of these uh, treatment modalities have certain risks associated with them. The key would be for us to be able to identify the relative risk versus the benefits that the patients get. Uh, very frequently, the lowest risk um, 
treatment option is not the best for the patient because as low as the risk may be in relation to the effect that it delivers, it is still a very high risk since the benefits are nil or negligible. So I think it's important that we uh, avoid um, uh, walking down the path of focusing only, well, a procedure since it has the lowest risk, it must be best. Uh, and we will talk about this a little later on a few slides. Um, last but not least is the issue of the affordability, um, which uh, you know we always think about it in the terms of patients have insurance, uh, but as more and more patients have elected to um, seek treatment and payments outside their health plans payments, such as Ozempic or Vigovi, uh, now we're experiencing and seeing patients where they're coming to our office where somehow they got a prescription for another clinician to get this medication at a tune, tune of hundreds of dollars a week. Their employment the environment has changed. Uh, their financial situation has changed. They had to cut the medication off and now they're experiencing weight gain and they want to know what they need to do. So I would bundle that the issue of the affordability needs to be included also in the evaluation of the long-term uh, risk of uh, and being able to afford the the uh, procedure or the treatment uh, for the best benefit. <clears throat> when we're looking uh, also at the uh, treatment options, um, we need to avoid uh, anecdotal information. Uh, as bariatric surgeons, um, most if not all of the surgeons and those of us that are in uh, uh, clinical practice uh follow the mbsa qip um, uh, standards the american college of surgeons center of excellence certification process uh, there are also um, uh, significant large body randomized uh, trials and studies by swedish object subject uh, the sos studies and the national institute of health uh, uh, diet kidney and diabetes uh, institute publications uh, the idea of following uh, the disciplined uh, structure and published data is to be able to quantify um, not only the outcome but also the mortality when we're discussing this information with the patients, for example. Um, I'm going to dive in right now to the, uh, the first phase of first uh, line of these modality of the treatments, which would be the diet plans. Um, it should be to no surprise uh, to anyone um, who is attending uh, uh, that most uh, of the dyes uh, fail and they also fail because they also fail most of the criteria that we um, uh, outlined earlier. They may not be effective uh, if you look at the uh, published data for most of the dyes out there. They have um, uh, low durability and low effectiveness. They work for a certain group of patients and they only uh, uh, work for a short period of time. They also interestingly are not reproducible population wide. It's interesting where you look at the published data, uh, certain, certain ethnicities do better with certain types of diet uh, versus other ethnicities. Affordability becomes an issue long term where if you have to subscribe to a certain diet uh, formula supplements um, and uh, they may have a relatively low risk but um, the collective um, ratio of risk to the benefits is also very low. Uh, they all have uh, meager yields, uh, limited weight loss and low durability. Uh, when we look at the medications, and this does not include the GLP-1, which is what we will uh, talk about here at length uh, uh, shortly, is the drug uh, therapy has historically been uh, unsuccessful to producing sustained weight loss. We all remember the FENFENs where um, uh, they worked uh, sort of the, the class of amphetamines essentially, where they worked well and the patients ended up with significant uh, uh, cardiac issues and hypertension. It is also surprising where still uh, fentramine is prescribed uh, and patients end up with significant hypertension and they have to stop the medication. Many weight loss drugs have adverse 
benefits to risk profile, uh, uh, as I said, with anxiety, uh, hypertension, and so forth. And uh, the, the weight loss may be modest, um, uh, but more importantly than the weight loss is there's no um, scientific literature that shows that any of the medications that are available, whether it be um, the uh, stimulant type of medication that increase the uh, metabolic pathways, though that limit the uh, fat absorption, uh, centrally acting serotonin, um, uh, 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 receptor uh, uh, blockers. Um, none of these medication have been shown to uh, improve um, either the long-term comorbidities or reduce mortality. So may, they may be nothing more than just a transient correction of what the patient reads on a scale, but does not change the uh, uh, long-term uh, plan uh, and the mortality. So one of the questions we want to ask is that though um, patients are in our office and what do the patients ask for? And uh, we may want to remember this answer. It's the uh, uh, glucagon-like uh, peptide uh, 1 receptor antagonist, the GLP-1RA. Um, so um, it's been a while since uh, I've looked at a biochemistry book, so I have to go back and remind myself what the glucagon does. Uh, glucagon is a chain of amino acids released from the um, alpha cells of the uh, uh, pancreas. Um, <clears throat> it uh, uh, trigger it's triggered by hypoglycemia, and uh, what it does is it affects multiple organs. And um, the release of the glucagon uh, go uh, affects on the brain uh, by uh, increasing the satiety and decreasing the appetite. I'm mentioning that uh, as the first because we'll come back to that shortly here. It increases the uh, insulin secretion from the beta cells of the pancreas, thus dropping the blood sugar, um, uh, serum sugar, and uh, moves the sugar from the uh into the cells um uh, from the serum uh from the gi tract the, the cells uh absorbed into the uh cells uh and uh at the level of the liver includes the glucose production um uh, increases the lipid breakdown and increases the ketone uh, body production uh at the level of the uh, adipose tissue, the brown tissue, the so-called so the fat and the omentum, it increases the uh, resting basal um, energy expenditure and also increases the cardiac function by increasing the heart rate and the contractibility. So it essentially, uh, if we're to sort of summarize all of these things, uh, if I have a higher glucagon level, whether this is uh, released by my alpha cells or given to me in a form of an oral pill or an injection, then I may experience some satiety, uh, lower appetite, my blood sugar will go down, I'll have a uh, higher basal metabolic rate um, and uh, sort of burn more sugar and more fats uh, essentially. Uh, looking specifically a little more in a form of a uh, cellular level, if we look at the graph on the uh, uh, the drawing on the left hand side, um, hypoglycemia um, is a triggering mechanism uh, when the uh, sugar uh, moves into the cell. The way this hypoglycemia um, by sh uh, glucose moving moving into the cell triggers a cascade uh, at the level of the myco mitochondria and a ATPs uh, uh, release. The ATP opens a potassium uh, channel, which causes a differential uh, a potential gradient between the potassium and the calcium channel. Calcium uh, rushes in into the cell and releases the glucagon. So when I have sugar, um, uh, when I have a high glucose in the serum and that glucose gets moved into the cell, the initiation of the hypoglycemia and a moving of the sugar uh, molecule into the cell is what triggers the glucagon release. When you look at the um, uh, normal physiology of the relationship between the um, 
plasma uh, glucagon level and the sugar uh, uh, glucose uh, release. Um, as a patient uh, consumes a sugar load, the glucagon is supposed to go down as uh, we want to think about in a normal physiologic function, the insulin and the glucagon uh, function in opposite way, pointing to the opposite way. Um, there's a paradoxical move in type 2 diabetic patients where <clears throat> as the glucose increases, even though it increases the, uh, the, the insulin release in order to mobilize the sugar intracellularly, there is a paradoxical increase in the glucagon. And this may be one of the explanations why patients who are diabetic um, uh, ordinarily uh, gain weight with the treatment uh, also. And um, w w this uh, may be one of the reasons why uh, GLP-1 class of medications work, and we'll get to it here shortly. Um, reviewing this again, uh, looking at this, um, the GLP-1, um, that we all talked about it, that this is actually released from the alpha cells of the pancreas. That's not all true. There are different uh, part of it is also uh, uh, released from part of the GI tract and also from the brain. But we talked about is how, in general, it increases the uh, insulin synthesis, um, increases the secretion of the uh, insulin, and the end result is to decrease the blood sugar. Uh, from a GI tract perspective, uh, it decreases the gastric emptying and uh, slows the peristalsis. And um, this is probably one of the most common um, problems that the patients with GLP-1 class of medications complain. Primarily, they experience the nausea and the vomiting and the abdominal pain and the constipation, which I uh, will uh, here talk about it shortly, um, is the cause of the most common compliance issue with all of the patients. Uh, at the uh, heart that we talked about that increases the basal uh, uh, sort of cardiac contractibility and the heart rate, um, uh, and at the level of the brain, uh, it's been uh, shown to decrease the patient's perception of the hunger and increases the satiety. Um, there is a lot of discussion about whether the GLP-1 uh, mechanism of the, uh, the primary mechanism of the ang uh, action is the a combination between the delayed in gastric emptying and delayed in the gastric uh, peristalsis and the satiety issue, and that tends to be much more anecdotal rather than objectively identified. So there, there's studies to be made and there's more uh, science that needs to prove the exact mechanism by the GLP-1 uh, uh, for weight loss. Um, just looking at the class of GLP-1 medication, historically these were medications, uh, glucagon-like uh, peptide analogs, that were created for treatment of diabetes. Uh, early studies show that uh, they, uh, patients uh, experience uh, the side effect at the time of the weight loss. Um, there's a number of these medications out there. Uh, some of them are not applied in the US by the FDA. Uh, most common of them are uh, weekly or daily injections. Um, and uh, uh, there are also uh, oral supplements, uh, oral uh, formulary uh, that's available in in, in, uh, in one or two uh, medications. Um, when we're talking about the GLP-1 to the patient, I think it's important to sort of outline a, a, a few issues. One of them that um, this is a medication that needs to be taken. Um, we don't want to use forever, but for foreseeable future. Um, there is no clear pathway uh, for why the weight loss is experienced. As I said earlier previously, that most um, uh, expert in the field will uh, point to the possible um, uh, correlation between the motility uh, gastric emptying and the perceived satiety and la uh, uh, loss of appetite as the underlying reason, but um, it's not really clear if that's uh, all there is to it. The uh, issue that this medication has to be taken long term is critical to be explained to the patient that um, as of today, as of uh, 
um, this presentation, there is no exit strategy with the GLP-1 medication, which means that patients may lose weight and they may keep it off uh, for short term because there are no long-term studies. And also, if and when they have to get off the medication for a number of reasons, um, we know that the weight will come back. Not only the weight comes back, but also the comorbidities that have resolved will come back. The earliest, uh, the, 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 the easiest way to sort of explain this to the patient may be the fact that if a diabetic, if, if a patient is taking the GLPA1 medication, if they're taking Vigovia or Zempic for diabetes and they've lost some weight, um, we can all know what happens when they stop taking it. Their weight will come back, but now their diabetic is also poorly controlled. So um, it is very important to uh, clarify with the patient why uh, the, the, there is no um, uh, sort of exit strategy with this medication. Um, the contraindication for this medication is patients that may have a risk for thyroid nodules and medullary thyroid carcinomas or ME, uh, MEN2s. There's numerous studies that has been shown in the rotens that if they have the uh, uh, MTCs or MEN2 syndrome, uh, GLP-1 uh, causes significant um, growth of these tumors. The most common uh, side effect of the medication include uh, has to do with the gastrointestinal. There is a study uh, uh, recently that was published from 2022 in Diabetic. Uh, a journal that showed 44% of the patients taking Vigovia had significant nausea. Uh, another study that was uh, uh, published in 2017 um, uh, by a very large group that was both in US and uh, Europe, they surveyed 10, 000, uh, near to 11,000 uh, uh, clinicians and patients and over a thousand of them were eventually included in the data analysis because one reason or another patients didn't follow up with the survey and all that and as you can see is that though from a patient's perspective the uh, number one reason why the patients would be uh, taken off the GLP-1 medications were uh, hypoglycemia and very close to that was nausea and vomiting. Uh, from a patient's perspective, the number one cause why they stopped using the medication, and that was about uh, you know 65% of the patients where they made them sick, they were nauseous, um, uh, and 50% uh, close to 50% of them had significant vomiting with these medications too. So going back to one of the earlier slides that I talked about the the importance of correlating risk versus benefits. Um, uh, even if you take the effect of the, uh, uh, the the value of the fact that these patients have to give these injections or take the tablets once a day or once a week uh, for the foreseeable future at a significant cost, the risk and um, the side effect of the nausea, vomiting, low blood sugar uh, causes a significant um, concern uh, when it comes to sort of the relatively low marginal risk, uh, low uh, benefit compared to the risk of 50% of patients having nausea and vomiting, for example. Um, so uh, the, the, the GLP-1 uh, plan, and um, I've referred to these uh, previously, again, these are Vigovia, Ozempic, uh, Druda uh, class of medications. They are glucagon-like peptide 1 receptor analogs. They mimic the function of the glucagon. They reduce the um, uh, serum glucose, decrease appetite. The mechanism of action for weight loss is not completely clear. The weight loss is sustained uh, as long as the patient takes medication. And it is important, as I said earlier, that uh, to be aware, to share this with the patients, that there are no long-term outcome uh, data available for these patients, which means that um, when the patient stops the medication, if and when at some point the weight will come back. Um, uh, the, there's a study in Diabetic Journal uh, uh, from 2022, just uh, earlier last year, that was published and says one year after we draw off once a week subcutaneous semaglutide 2.4 milligram injection, which is sort of the highest dose of the medication. Patients are supposed to start at a low dose and incrementally as tolerate increase the dose. Participant gained two-thirds of the weight prior to weight loss, 
and with similar changes in the cardiometabolic variables. What this means is that the patients not only gain weight, uh, gain their weight back, but also their risk profile, uh, things that uh, would have improved their blood sugars, their lipid panels, uh, also uh, return back to pretreatment uh, uh, levels. Um, I would like to talk briefly about the GLP-1 compounding. These are the uh, 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 promotions, uh, emails, marketing uh, that most of us may be getting in our office. Um, GLP-1 uh, class of medication, both of Zempic and Vagovia, became so financially um, uh, lucrative for the pharmaceuticals that pharmacists uh, would rather sell them off the prescription for weight loss rather than prescription for uh, diabetes. So there's a shortage on that because of that FDA uh, sort of went down this road of possibly allowing some compounding to take place. Um, and then um, the information uh, uh, is what it's, it has become uh, very murky and unclear for a number of reasons. Number one is that the uh, compounding medications is a way to circumvent the patent protection. There's already legal challenges to a lot of these spas and f uh, compounding pharmacies that are producing these. Uh, from the manufacturers. Um, also, um, in order to circumvent the patent protection, uh, compounder, uh, compounding pharmacies are using the peptide analogs in a salt base. And there's been um, significant uh, incidences of uh, complications of hypertension and hypertensive crisis that have been reported to the FDA primarily because of the very high salt content of these medications. This uh, uh, picture is from a pharmaceutical, <clears throat> compounding pharmaceutical that recommends these medications uh, for sale to the physicians. And as you can see, their way is to have a, um, a, a salt mixture uh, and a vitamin B12 into the mixture. Um, we don't uh offer the um, injections uh, in our office to our patients we have no source for getting them and uh this uh, the, 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 the thing got clipped uh, uh it is recommended that any clinician who's contemplating using this medication contact their licensing and the regulatory agency um, to make sure that they can um, uh, from the proper channel get these compounded medications um, I'd like to shift here and go to the surgical component of the obesity. So briefly, we talked about the diet plans. We talked about briefly about medication. And I think from a um, uh, medical treatment options that we need to be aware of right now is the GLP-1, is the Ozempic and the um, uh, Vigovia uh, medications. And we need to remember and remind the patients that these medications uh, have so if it, as benign as nausea and vomiting may be, have a very high incidence of side effect and complications. For most patients, they need to be started on a low dose and over a matter of months uh, up to a higher dose. The weight loss is very varied and their uh, statistics have talked about 10, 15 pounds uh, for most patients, nothing more. And most importantly is that if and when the patients stop the medication, the weight will come back. Um, Shifting now to surgical history, um, the, the treatment of obesity surgically has evolved over the last 30 years or so. We started from the old JI bypass, very effective, but very high complication of liver failure of death. The, um, the, the jejunilinal and the uh, small bowel resection exclusion, these patients that with blind loop syndrome. And then the loop gastric bypass, which sort of was relatively low invasive, but uh, these patients also had things by reflux gastritis and weight regain. Uh, then evolved into the vertical banded uh, gastroplasty or the phobi pouch with a ring. And uh, there's a whole bunch of other procedures in between them, but we'll sort of uh, uh, take it for that. Um, 
the the newest uh, the latest thing that has been out there is the intragastric balloon um, and uh, there has been a number of balloons that have been um, uh, have come to the market um, the single uh, balloon sailing then two uh, or up to three balloons um, uh, balloons that are also uh, filled with air and there's also some with nitrogen the issue with the sailing balloon was that they are so heavy the patient has this chronic feeling of the nausea and vomiting and a stretch of the stomach so that was switched to having a nitrogen and or filling it up with air where it uh, fills up the volume without really the weight of it uh, there's also uh, a balloon that are uh, released into the European Union but not in the US they require endoscopy and uh, only one of them is able to be uh, swallowed the ovarian group the uh, therapy has been found only to have a, a temporary effect up to three years despite repeated uh, balloon placement. The weight loss the experience does improve obesity related comorbidities, but typically the weight is regained and the positive effect of the comorbidities are resolved. There is a number of studies out there that have proven that balloons do not do anything long term. Um, Balloons are um, one of those procedures that are advocated as to being a very simple procedure. The patient may be advocated to think about it as it's nothing more than an endoscopy. So on a risk a benefit ratio, it may be um, advocated or sold to the patient as a very low risk procedure but when you cut the long-term effect of it the patient needs to every six months go and have it removed and replaced and at the end of the uh, thousands of dollars every six months there's no tangible benefit to this procedure so as a part of my practice we recommend against any gastric balloon placement when you look at the adjustable gastric banding um, I think we uh, were all mostly now aware of how um, this also did not work long term adjustable gastric banding with a removal rate of six percent annually and the need for revision of more than two-thirds of them after removal it does not have to uh, it doesn't appear to be a long-term uh, um, uh, solution to obesity this is uh, um, the references are all, uh, i should have mentioned this earlier all of these quotations and uh, 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 data that's quoted all have references scientifically I'll make this available to uh, the society and for those of you that are interested you can reference the or uh, find the referenced articles uh, adjustable gastric banding is also associated with short uh, poor and long-term weight loss outcome and a very high uh, failure rate uh, we do not, as a part of our practice, recommend anyone to get the adjustable gastric banding down. There was a um, study about a few years ago from um, um, uh, Europe, uh, which essentially said, uh, parallel to what that first statement said, about 6% annually and two-thirds of the patient needed removed, that eventually, uh, over a 10-year period, nearly 100% of the adjustable gastric bandings need to be revised and or replaced which is why as a matter of practice, if any patients are seen in our office for adjustments, my recommendations are for the bands to come out uh, and it's easier to remove the band that's not slipped or complicated uh, electively versus having to deal with it on a weekend at the middle of the night when the band has suddenly um, uh, uh, slipped and it's uh, uh, leading towards perforation, bleeding and so forth. Um, uh, Similar to the previous data, again, these are three references that nearly 50% of the patients required band removal, um, contributing to reoperation rate of 60%. Um, go back here, stomach has um, pushed up and the band has slipped. So this band needs to come out uh, emergently. Um, in this case, the band moved uh, in an axis where you can sit. And there are cases where you can see sometimes the donut of the band itself. That also means that the band has don't uh, has uh, has slipped in an anterior posterior fashion. And so when we look at this um, uh, animation, you can see this is a, a band of a patient that has marginally slipped. Um, it sort of um, I moved the cursor; it moved the back to the beginning. I'll just leave that at that. You can sort of see how the band is. Uh, not quite 
between 0 to 90 degree but just a little below the um, uh, uh, zero degree angle so it may be also slipping and the next one you can see how it has completely slipped now so these two patients both had slip band these are reconstructions from a t uh, the, the 3d image reconstruction from a ct scans that were done and you appreciate how these bands are slipped um, these patients need to be seen uh, urgently by a patient uh, by, by a surgeon the um, the key the take-home message would be that a patient with a history of adjustable gastric banding that shows up with sudden uh, onset of nausea abdominal pain uh, they may experience shoulder pain back pain these patients need to be emergently be seen by a surgeon or it's an hour after hour be sent to an emergency room uh, why weight loss surgery procedures? As we discussed earlier, uh, cause of obesity are multifactorial. There may be genetic, hormonal, diet and exercise, uh, uh, family infertility, food and activity level related. Um, we have very little control over our internal um, uh, thermostat. Uh, if we think about it, we have very little margin into up or down regulating our metabolic pathways. Um, the reason why weight loss surgeries work is that diets and exercise do not work. We talked about the uh, long-term outcome of most of the medical treatment. The GLP-1 uh, glucant-like uh, peptide medication is sort of the wild card here that remains to be seen what their long-term outcome are, uh, of them are going to be. In my opinion, I think they may not work long-term because as with anything else, as we... Uh, secondarily control the end product we are also down regulating the regulatory mechanism so if we add the thyroid medication by medication we turn down the tsa so we just don't know what happens to the regulatory regulators of the glucagon when we give the patients glucon one medication <clears throat> Uh, we will talk about here and show that how the long-term uh, outcome of the uh, weight loss surgical procedures are Um, there are uh, the procedure on um, on the left is the gastric bypass uh, which used to be the most common procedure uh, out there and it has uh, f uh, fallen off favor uh, because it not only doesn't have a sustained long-term outcome uh, it is technically harder to perform and it also has a higher complication rate um, adjustable gastric banding uh, used to be one of the most common procedures out there uh, because of a very aggressive uh, and robust marketing by the manufacturers and uh, we all uh, must have patients who had the adjustable gastric banding and they've not done well um, and they've had it replaced. Uh, the procedure um, that's marked sleeve gastrectomy is the, one of the most common procedures uh, done out there. Um, it's important to appreciate that this is not sort of the latest procedure that's been uh, identified. Um, in our practice, we've been doing the dual switches for uh, 25 years or so, and every single one of these patients had sleeve gastrectomy. There were a subset of patients that we used to do the sleeve gastrectomy, and we continue to do them as a first stage of the dual switch for uh, not losing them. And um, uh, just briefly, um, essentially what happens is that we mobilize the greater curvature of the stomach so the stomach is grabbed this is a robotic sleeve gastrectomy that's done we take the uh, uh, gastroepiploic and the gastri uh, the short gastric vessels from the stomach uh, disconnecting them uh, so as we mobilize the uh, stomach from all of the connections uh, all the way to the splenic hilum um, uh, we uh, have a, a tube in the stomach to allow us to give the size of the stomach and um, as we've taken all of the short gastrics we get to uh, branches between the spleen and the stomach um, it is very important that the surgeon uh, uh, takes the entire fundus and the stomach down from the splenic hilum other one these patients will come back with inadequate weight loss and or some weight gain um, when the entire stomach is removed and I've sort of um, for the sake of time I've deleted uh, or I've shown some of the video here as we mobilize the splenic flexure um, 
and we take the entire stomach out from the spleen I will continue doing this um, then we start uh, doing the sleeve gastrectomy component and you can see there is a tube in the stomach right now that allows us to size the stomach that's a uh, uh, high 30s to low 40 size bougie uh, dilator so if you want to think about it, size of a thumb uh, over time this thing will stretch a little but it will never go back to its original size so the key is to uh, make sure we um, take enough of the stomach without really causing a narrowing across it so uh, we position the the tube at the incisora where the stomach comes down and gets close to the pylorus and uh, and the stapler fires we uh, the part that's to our uh, to the images right uh, by my picture is the part of the stomach that's going to come out and uh, The stapler leaves uh, three staples on each side and cuts in, in between them. And as the stapler releases, I can sort of, at the interest of time, move this a little forward. All right. Uh, so, and then as we continue... Um, to do uh, to fire more cartridges you can see that's a stomach that um, uh, comes out and this is the part of the stomach uh, I'm, uh, that's the stomach that will stay in and this is the stomach that will come out so that essentially translates into about 75 uh, 80 percent of the stomach so before we also leave the uh, before we remove the stomach specimen and um, uh, we fill up the abdominal cavity with uh, sterile water, pump air into the stomach by anesthesia staff, and so to make sure there is no air bubbles, which means that there is no leak. So this is the 20, uh, 75, 80 percent of the stomach that comes out. This comes through one of the ports, and that's the part of the stomach that's uh, left behind. Um,
looking at the long-term success of all of the weight loss surgical procedures duodenal switch uh, provides the best outcome followed by sleeve gastric banding does the worst and uh, so does uh, balloon and gastric bypasses in between them uh, when we're looking at the surgical outcomes um, uh, this is an example of how we sort of want to quantify both the short-term and the long-term outcome so gastric bypass may provide the best three-year outcome but uh, five years out, uh, gastric sleeve patients do really well. Drug therapy is the one that there is lack of data. These are the ones that I said earlier that we don't know what's going to happen to GLP-1 type of um, medications out there. Uh, we not only have to think about the weight loss and comorbidities, but we also need to look at the life expectancy. Uh, there's a um, uh, set of data that was published back in 2020 by Swedish obese subject study, the SOS study, that uh, when they looked at their control of the patients versus all of the weight loss surgical procedures, this was uh, the uh, SOS study included gastric bypass and adjustable gastric banding. What they looked at was the life expectancy of the patients, regardless of the about five ten percent. Uh, weight gain of those that had early weight loss up to 20 years they did much better than their control of the patients that who did not have weight loss surgery further uh, out uh, comparing the outcomes of the um, weight loss um, and uh, diabetic and non-diabetic patients this includes patients at a younger age what was shown again that the weight loss should be offered to patients earlier again this was a secondary result from the uh, SOS study from 2020 that younger population uh, BMI at 20 years those who had weight loss surgery earlier ripped the benefit of the weight loss up to 10 years at this study and more important, if you look at the top um, uh, bar graph when you're complete, uh, comparing the incidence of diabetes, those patients that were diabetic early on and had weight loss surgery, um, after weight loss surgery, their um, diabetic uh, blood sugars were lower than what the control was before and without weight loss surgery. Um, when we look at all of these opposing forces of the cost is represented by the size of the uh, circle, the benefits versus the risk, uh, diets may have low risk, low benefits, uh, sort of uh, low cost. Medications may have uh, mid risk with all of the complications, uh, very expensive, but also low benefit. Um, I think it's important for us to distinguish between devices and the surgery. Gastric balloons and the band are devices that are implanted. They're associated with very high cost, relatively high risk and low benefits, which sort of um, uh, also relatively to this uh, surgery, um, uh, comparatively sc uh, speaking, uh, according to the MBSA QIP data, in, including the SOS data and the NIH published data, the mortality from weight loss surgical procedure is 0.3%. Um, uh, I want to remind ourselves about that uh, high risk complication of the gastric balloon and the band and the 40% uh, complication of the medication. So statistically speaking, the relative risk benefit is much more in favor of the surgery. Um, as to where do we go from here, the long-term outcome um, uh, of the procedures and treatment we offer our patients need to be discussed. Um, the, we need to also be careful not to necessarily just talk about the absolute risk. We need to distinguish between absolute risk in relation to the uh, benefit, which means that the relative risk and the benefit options for each procedure needs to be um, uh, evaluated and included. The longevity of the outcome is important. Um, uh, there is uh, studies that have looked at not only the weight loss, uh, but also the resolution of the comorbidities, but also patient satisfaction. Quite frequently, the uh, weight loss um, and the, uh, the, the improvement of the comorbidities and the patient satisfaction are all attained at a relatively lower point of view, a lower point of weight loss, 
whereas patients who are experiencing the side effect of the device or the medication are not at all satisfied with the procedure itself. Um, one other thing that we also need to uh, consider is the long-term um, cost consideration. Um, weight loss surgical procedures um, may uh, be costly at the uh, front end, but for the most part, uh, barring any unforeseen complications that uh, occurs relatively infrequently, um, uh, they do not require any maintenance long-term. That's unlike the medications, injections, uh, balloons, and um, uh, banding that require long-term treatment. And uh, in our practice, we've seen groups of patients that have come back, as I said earlier, that have started going um, down the path of uh, PLG1 uh, injections, and now they can't afford them, and they're gaining weight, and they're looking for alternative plans. Um, so in summary, we, uh, we I outlined that diets and exercise don't work. We just can't tell the patients to eat right and exercise. Everything would be fine. We need to intervene early. Um, this includes also very young uh, adolescents uh, around puberty. Uh, make sure their growth plates are closed. Um, and um, it's easier and healthier for the young children not to become diabetic lifelong uh, to, uh, by avoiding their treatment and delaying their treatment. We should discuss the long-term uh, plan with the patient.